Derek Jackson, our speaker today. Um, I know him because I read the Globe, and in the Globe there is a there are columns, and his columns appear regularly. And I will tell you that his information in those columns appear in my classes on a regular basis. Um, he's uh, very well informed. He's a voice for social justice, and very, he's going to have a lot to offer in today's talk. Um, some of his distinctions in terms of uh, his profession. Um, he was the finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2001, which is the highest prize you can get in journalism. Um, he was the 18-time finalist and six-time winner in the National Association of Black Journalists, a two-time winner and four-time finalist for the National Education Writers Association. And he's headed to Berlin, Germany next week to speak on cultural stereotypes at an international media conference. So we're talking about somebody that is preeminent in his field, has a lot to offer. Um, the way we're going to be setting this up uh, is he will be speaking, but he's going to be inviting questions. There'll be plenty of time for questions. People should jot things down. And uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for people to raise your issues. You can offer opinions on things you have to say and get his take on it, or you can ask questions about various topics. So let me introduce Derek Jackson. One, one other thing, I'm mean, passing out evaluation forms, and uh, so take one and please fill those out before you leave today. Thank you, Dan. And uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. And good morning, um, Mr. President. It's not uh, often I have presidents, uh, <laughs> you know, with all the busy things that you have to do to run a university, college. I appreciate uh, your presence as well. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, is start off um, th three years ago. Um, I was very fortunate to um, uh, cover many parts of the uh, campaign of uh, the, uh, Barack Obama. Um, uh, interviewed him several times one-on-one -on -one in his uh, car as he was running for president in places like Iowa, Pennsylvania. Um, uh, saw him speak in 10, about 10, 11 states, and um, uh, I have also had several. Um, I'm the co-founder of a national uh, black columnist group, uh, that what we call the Trotter Group, uh, named after William Monroe Trotter, the publisher of the Guardian newspaper, one of the first black newspapers um, in the United States. And... Um, so I've been on, with our Trotter group, we've been in on several um, small group interviews with him uh, before he became president. And um, so I just want to, um, I did an audio commentary for the inauguration, and I'd like to play that for you, and then maybe talk, begin to talk about what's happened since he's been elected. What I've learned is that if it, I have to sometimes reboot it to get it going. W.E.B. Du Bois once wrote that African Americans simply wish to make it possible for a man to be both Negro and American without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. Langston Hughes once wrote that America never was America to me. He said, oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. For so long, opportunity was so false. Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties? Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. What would Du Bois, Hughes, and Dunbar thought of Barack Obama riding endless hours past fields of corn, bales of hay, hills caked with ice, campaigning across vastly white Iowa? What would they have thought of him in autumn's glow, in oncoming winter's gloom, Beseeching town halls in equally white New Hampshire, where the poet Claude McKay once lamented he could not enjoy the springing April grass, the happy winds 
sweet May flowers and the silver speckled sky, wasting his golden hours indoors, washing windows and scrubbing floors. But not only that, what would the poets and scholars of yesteryear thought of the sight of Obama on college campuses starved for inspiration, among people of color wanting for liberation? Here was this politician out of relative nowhere asking everyone to take off the mask, asking everyone to wear a new patriotic wreath, campaigning in state after state, city after city, town after town, farm hamlet to frayed downtowns, so often under the American flag, asking everyone to say, America is America to me. No matter what Obama does, and there will be disappointment with achievement, his election sang the song of James Weldon Johnson, song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us, song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Many people ask me what it was like to be in Chicago's Grand Park the night of Obama's election. I will most remember the crowd of people saying the Pledge of Allegiance. In my 53 years, I have never heard such a multicultural throng recite the pledge with such determined enunciation, expelling it from the heart soaring to the skies and a bass drumming through the soil to vibrate my feet. Liberty and justice for all evoke neither clank of chains nor cackle of cruelty, but a warm tickle of Jeffersonian slave owning irony. Justice cannot sleep forever. But none of this would have happened without the right candidate for the moment. For four centuries of discipline culminated in Barack Obama's drive to the Grant Park podium as president elect. He smiled, but the slow swan's grace of his waving made it clear he would not mimic the explosive jubilation from the seat of humanity before him. It was more than the weariness of the campaign and the laden years ahead. He knew that to be on that podium, he had to channel every lesson of pioneering African-American figures. He had to be serious without being angry. He had to relate without being a clown. He had to be the soul brother for the nation without being a singer or preacher. He had to be cool without being cold and above all, he could never lose his cool. Obama walked with the slaves who toiled for two and a half centuries in the cotton fields who could never lose their cool, enduring the lash, family separation, castration, and rape. He had the focus of the Underground Railroad conductor Harriet Tubman, who led over 300 black people into freedom in 19 trips. When she threatened to shoot a weary escapee who wanted to give up, Tubman is quoted as saying, he jumped right up and went on as well as anybody. Tubman boasted, I never ran my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. Ida B. Wells kept writing against lynching after her Memphis newspaper office was destroyed. Black soldiers fought for national unity or global security even when they faced segregation here at home. My father, a Korean War veteran, left Mississippi for Milwaukee when he saw a black World War II veteran who lost a leg fighting for his country get kicked out of a restaurant my father-in-law, who fought in the Buffalo Soldiers on the Italian front in World War II, said it was amazing how little racism he encountered in Italy compared with the United States. Jackie Robinson and Hank Aaron wore a mask of calm despite the abuses heaped upon them. Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall scoured the law to end desegregation. When Rosa Parks refused to give up her bus seat, Joanne Robinson mimeographed 35,000 leaflets overnight for the Montgomery bus boycott. Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois stressed industry and intellect. As Fannie Lou Hamer risked beatings fighting for voting rights, saying she was sick and tired of being sick and tired, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X beautifully walked the tightrope of holding the nation accountable for racism while pushing for personal responsibility. And then there were the millions of ordinary black parents who told their children that no matter the barriers, no matter how lonely it could feel in America, there were no excuses for not trying to achieve. All of this was in Obama as he stood at the podium at Grand Park, beginning his lonely road as president. He was the Tubman who never let his train off the track. He walked Martin's and Malcolm's tightrope into the hearts of millions of Americans, creating a sense of shared responsibility in this country for the first time in many years. This man who was raised by a single parent and grandmother made no excuses. A critical mass of Americans responded by saying, yes, he can. America once exploited the discipline of black people to create the nation's wealth. Now, it has picked the most disciplined black man of our time to protect it. The next four or eight years offer a critical opportunity to complete this circle of history. Underachieving black children are going to see a black man as president of all the people. 
the most powerful man on earth, in a way that was never possible before. They know there are no excuses. It is time to heed the order from Harriet Tubman to jump up and go on as anybody. Suddenly, amid great turmoil, a sliding nation appears poised to bury the ghosts of its past by seeing in Obama the discipline and new brand of patriotism we all need now. This is Derek Jackson for the Boston Globe. For those who saw the slideshow, that was three years ago. And I, I'm, I'm a very bad salesman for myself. Uh, I should have also told you that all the photographs in that slideshow were mine. Uh, and uh, I'm a photographer. I was, uh, uh, I should say, uh, before we get going, that um, I am a public high school graduate from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and a commuter, commuter public college graduate from UW-Milwaukee, uh, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, which is essentially um, the equivalent here in Massachusetts of going to UMass Boston. And um, just to give you an idea that you can take you don't have to go to Harvard or Brown or Princeton to achieve something. How many of you think it would be really cool um, to have a, um, be on the field of Gillette Stadium at your age with a uh, photo pass shooting the Patriots football games? How many of you think it would be very cool to be on the floor of TD Bank North uh, the, uh, the Boston Garden. I can't do the banks. <laughs> How many of you think it would be cool to be on the floor of the garden shooting Paul Pierce, Ray Allen, and Kobe Bryant? <laughs> How many of you would think that would be really cool to be in the photo box at first or third base at Fenway Park shooting the Red Sox? Well, when I was your age, literally, not kidding, um, I, I was, took journalism so seriously in high school that by the time I got to college, I was able to be an apprentice for the Associated Press. And, um, and whenever the guy from the Associated Press wanted to take the night off, he let this little, between the ages of 17 and 20, uh, he let this 17, 18 year old, 19 year old kid go down to um, the Milwaukee Arena County Stadium, Lambeau Field. Um, I shot, for you football fans, I shot every Packers home game at Lambeau Field when I was in college. So I just say that to say that um, you work hard. There are no guarantees in life, of course. Um, and, uh, but I just mention that because uh, you can still go, my, uh, just in closing, my, I was a big brother in the uh, Big Brothers program in the uh, South Bronx when I used to live in New York. And um, I worked for Newsday in New York for 10 years, um, soon after college. And I was matched with a uh, boy who was eight years old at the time. And uh, he went to Lakeland, ultimately his mother moved him to Florida to get him out of the gang banging and he uh, eventually went to Lakeland Community College. I'm sure you've heard of that. Um, uh, he flunked out of Lakeland once. He survived. He went on to Central University of Central Florida, flunked out of there once. Uh, so he flunked out of college twice, but he still persevered. And today, he, I really didn't have anything to do with this part, but he, he became a writer. And today, he is the number one writer covering the Detroit Lions for Booth newspapers in the, for the whole state of Michigan. So, and again, community college, we used to call it junior college when I was a kid. That somehow that became demeaning. I don't know. Um, he's a community college graduate, a public university graduate. There's still a world out there. And don't let anybody from Harvard or the big elite schools tell you that you're anything less um, because you're here and not over there. Um, and um, so Barack Obama was elected three years ago. It was considered a historic moment. How much history has been made since then? Any thoughts? R any brief thoughts from people? Yeah. This hand gesture right here. Uh-huh. You mean Obama's? 
or mine? Take your time, take your time. So do you think there's been change in the last three years? Well, I know there has been change. There's been changes to stuff, but not like, not like it wasn't instant or extreme enough. Not a lot of people noticed mm. what happened. Okay, yes. Okay. Anybody else? Two or three more, and then yes. I think you made enough change, but using another definition for it, because uh, all the mess that came into here for his president, and I think if for all of us, we wouldn't even have health insurance if it wasn't for him. Well, he, I think he's done a lot as a president. He has a bad rap for it, but the mess that came into it. Okay. A couple others. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, it does resemble a uh, I-93 traffic jam sometimes. <laughs> Last one, yes. Occupy for now. Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street. All streets. All, I'm sorry. All streets. All streets. <laughs> occupy all streets. All streets. You want to occupy all streets. I think we should occupy all streets. Okay, all right. All right, I'll give you my thoughts, um, and then we'll you know, open it up fairly quickly for questions I can tell that you have a fair amount on your mind. Let me just go back a bit to, um, I had to many times uh, during, uh, in the early parts, um, many of my friends, I live in Cambridge, which we often nickname the People's Republic of Cambridge. Um, for people, a lot of people consider themselves quite left of center. And for in the early uh, part of the Obama administration, there was a fair amount of disappointment um, because, uh, well, he's not going to give us single payer health care. He's not, he hasn't ended the war. He, he's he's going to build up, he says he's going to build up the war in Afghanistan and, and whatnot. And I, I say to them, I said, well, if you were paying attention, but Obama was, by the way, of he did the classic thing that all politicians do. Um, he is, was so effective in his speaking that if there's today, it looks like there's about 60 or 70 people in this room. If Obama was here, there would be 60, 70 versions of what he just said, depending on what you wanted to hear. So the anti-war people, um, he was basically, his campaign was launched in Iowa with his victory in the Iowa caucuses. Uh, it was launched because there was an unusually strong anti-war sentiment in Iowa that overrode um, the prior popularity and the money of Hillary Clinton. Um, in fact, had the first election happened in New Hampshire instead of Iowa, my view is that Hillary Clinton would be president today. That's just the luck of the draw and the way momentum works in presidential elections. But then, um, I actually asked him in a small group meeting about health care. And he said to me, and to the group, what do you think about single payer? And his answer was, and those of you who were paying attention on the campaign, trail and the TV news, he said very clearly, 
if it, in a perfect world, I would be for single payer like Canada and much of Europe has, but that's not the America we have. We have to be more incremental. We have to involve the insurance companies and so forth. And so anyone who was disappointed that he did not discuss single payer wasn't, they weren't paying attention to the campaign. And eventually we got this sort of compromise, which I feel will probably collapse eventually. It'll probably slowly collapse because of what people are still paying for prescription drugs and whatnot. Um, you made a point up there in the old Navy sweatshirt. The one thing that's very different is that I, as a father, can insure my son till he's 26. Um, doesn't have to be in college anymore. That's important. Pre-existing conditions can no longer be factored against you to get insurance. That's important. Um, so, so there are some. There are definitely things that did get, um, I think, changed. Um, but since this is ostensibly a Black History Month talk, I'll just briefly talk about um, what I think has changed in terms of him being president as an African American, and um, what I think the work is still to be done. I think what the Obama election did prove in an unprecedented way, in a way that, cross my fingers, this nation will never go backwards again, is that America advanced to the point where if it could, uh, gave itself enough time to take a look at one individual, African American, or for that matter, person of color, because I can see in this room there are many, many ethnicities, that America will, could give that person a fair shot, or a much fairer shot than my parents experienced. Now, if you want to be a nitpicker, Obama did not get the majority of the white vote in America overall. McCain still got, John McCain, who was his, you know, the runner-up, McCain still got the majority white vote if you just added it up all across the country. But Obama won the white vote or got enough of the white vote in, so, in enough critical states that it put him way over the top. He won very easy. He won very easily in the electoral college. So to me, that's very, very good news. The tough part is that his election has not yet, I think, even remotely, had a major effect on what I would call systemic and legacy um, forms, institutionalized forms of discrimination um, that are so embedded in our society that people don't even know they're there. And they also are so embedded that a lot of people just don't even think about investing the energy to get rid of them. And what are some examples of those? We're living through one right now with the, this recession. The national unemployment rate has went up to about 10% during the worst of the recession. It's now dropped a little bit back down to 8.5, something like that. But it has had no effect on, in fact, it might even be worse to some degree, the African-American unemployment rate has remained about double through the whole thing, getting as high for black men up to around 18% or so 
during the height of the recession. One out of every five people who look like me unemployed in America. And uh, there's certainly because of all the, uh, you think you, you mentioned in the Red Sox shirt up there, the gridlock. Um, the gridlock has certainly not helped. Um, and also our politics are so uh, polarized that the notion of even thinking about specialized targeted programs that recognized disparate um, situations. I mean, in a logical world, you look at a population that has got nearly 20% unemployment and you say, we gotta do something a little extra to make sure they get employed. But that, does, that is not anywhere remotely on the horizon uh, at the moment. Um, we'll get to questions in a little bit later. All right, so, um, so there's that. I know there's some, uh, back in the, you're from New Bedford High School, right? Uh, sorry? Whaling City. Whaling City, all right. Um, and uh, uh, education, public education is clearly one of the most stinging remaining legacies of discrimination that's, uh, it's really going to take a, an unprecedented effort, if and whenever it happens, to overhaul it and, uh, re and bring the gaps of opportunity from uh, kids who go to school in urban centers to kids of like ridiculous privilege in private schools. Uh, I, I'm very fortunate. Uh, living in Cambridge, the public high school is actually reasonably quite well funded and if you, if you work hard enough you can get a serious education in there. Um, many school systems are so bereft of money, uh, some get taken over by the city, some get taken over by the state. Um, the, by various measures, there's no question that the opportunity gaps in uh, education have, uh, have grown with a resegregating over the last 20 years of kids into high, high concentrated poverty, um, um, poverty school zones. I think third and um, most importantly, I think to me is that there is, the country has to, I hope this makes sense, and is not too um, odd sounding to you, but the Obama election offered, still does offer, a chance for, and the reason I, there, I think many of these other is issues are not addressed is because America cannot make up its mind between two competing philosophies. At least they've been, compete, they've been juxtaposed as competing philosophies. One philosophy is the rugged individual and exceptionalism. America, like perhaps no other developed country on earth, has this philosophy of honoring the exceptional person which actually gets to what something uh, this uh, young woman said in the pink shirt about celebrities, um, uh, how, well, how we give them such uh, disproportionate publicity as opposed to or compared to police officers and firefighters and teachers. Somebody mentioned school teachers. You mentioned school teachers. We, we praise the rise of people who rise above all odds, and we put them on this pedestal, whether it's Barack Obama being the first black president, or an athlete who, um, I mean, look at, look, at the, look at the publicity for Jeremy Lin right now. Uh, even I got on the, on the internet this morning 
and, and uh, yesterday morning to watch his game-winning shot against the Toronto Raptors. I just had to see what this craziness was all about. Just because an Asian American can, can throw a ball into a hoop. It's all of a sudden, everybody's like crazy about this. Um, so there's this real competing, there's this rugged individualism that honors individual success. And I would argue it honors that success almost to an excess, not almost, to an excessive degree. To a degree that we completely lose track of how is the group doing. Does that begin to make sense a little bit? So let's compare the United States to some other countries right now. Um, Sweden, I've been, I've been very fortunate in recent years to go to countries like Sweden, Denmark. I'm going to Germany next week, but I've been to Germany a couple other times. Switzerland, England. They don't have that many players in the NBA. <laughs> they don't produce. How many Swedish rock stars are there? How many Danish um, NFL players are there? <laughs> they don't, interestingly, you go over there and they might not have all that stuff, the glitter of the individual, superstar individual, but what they do have is universal health care. They have, I hate to tell you this, they have free or very reduced education all the way to your college degree. We had dinner with friends in uh, Stockholm a uh, couple years ago, and their kids go to public school. In fact, it's funny. The husband's a journalist like me. The wife is a medical researcher like my wife. And their kids go to public school for free. They're going to college for free. And if they go to graduate school, they get significantly reduced. If they stay in school, get the good grades, like a B average, they have significantly reduced graduate school. Similar, similar things in uh, Sweden, I mean, I'm in, in Denmark, Norway. I'm not saying anything's perfect in any one country, but their focus, their governmental focus, their social focus, actually is much more on the group. And how is the group doing? How is the country doing? And I think that is the crux, not just of race, not just of some individual issue, that is at the crux of a huge amount. That's a, the crux of the education gaps in this country. There's no, there's not a single, well, I shouldn't say there's not a single, because I don't know this, but the average student debt in the United States is now college student debt. You, the average college student leaves college and with a $25,000 debt. The vast majority of youth in countries that care more about the group, Europe, throughout Europe, they don't leave with like a sense debt. So um, somebody said, you said occupy all streets. So I mean, the ch one of the challenges of your generation um, is, yes, there's been I think a lot of progress. My parents grew up in segregated Mississippi. They moved to Milwaukee for factory jobs. They provided um, the groundwork for their children to get a fine education, public education. Um, as a, those of you who came in late, I'm a graduate of UW-Milwaukee, um, which is the equivalent in Wisconsin of UMass Boston. My sister graduated from the big Madison, the big Wisconsin, UW-Madison. But we are still, even after all of those civil rights marches, 
even with Obama's election, the divisions that of, I think now, humongously class-based divisions and the concentration of wealth and who runs the country based on wealth is a challenge that you have that um, wasn't as evident to us 30, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So um, in closing kind of set remarks and then questions, the title of this was The Continuing Reality of Race in America. The continuality of race in and of itself is the institutional. Will this country ever care enough about the group? Not just say, we got a black president, yay, we're done. What about the 18% black men unemployment? What about anything that's dis, dis, disproportionately disadvantaged? But that philosophy extends to just about everything else. And especially since you all are college students, I would say especially education. There's no reason in the world why you should leave, in my view, there's no reason in the world that why you should leave college owing a down payment on a house. You should be free to pursue your dreams regardless of cash. That's the whole point that we sell you on, us, us old people, we sell you on this like, go to college, pursue your dreams. But the first thing on your mind should not be when you graduate from college, how do I pay this debt? You take a dead end job to pay off the debt, which begins to kill your dream. Um, you are going to have, health care is going to remain a huge, um, huge issue. I think the good news, the good news of bad news, and I'll close with this thought. The good news of the bad news is that the challenges of the current America, while they certainly have major, there are certain, certainly major racial problems um, that are structural, this moment offers, I think, an unprecedented opportunity with health care, with education, um, with redoing our cities so that we have better public transportation, um, reducing our focus on, even though I'm a former sports writer, reducing all this crazy focus on Giselle and, and Jeremy Lin and Tom Brady, and I'm a big Hackers fan, but there's a point where it's like too much. There is so much of all this stuff that everybody can fight all together. Malcolm X, one of the things that I most admire Malcolm X about is toward the end of his life, he realized that the struggle for, to end racism was a struggle that everybody could join in. Early in his career as a spokesperson, he did not believe that. The question is, can America end its divided politics and gridlock so that it recognizes that all these problems, if solved together, save everybody. Take your questions. No questions? I, that was that was depressing. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a couple comments to make. I hope they don't sound partisan, but um, yeah. the, uh, when you asked about his legacy, uh, uh, there was a point I'd like to make. It always astonished me that January 21st, 2009, it became the Obama recession after it had been built up for two years prior to that. Mm. But uh, during that recession, and I'm certainly glad to uh, say that he kept his focus on the economy and some of these other things that needed to be done couldn't be done. But um, what I wanted to point out was the, the stimulus money, the ARRA money. There are people mm -hmm. in this room, and certainly people at the college, that would no longer be employed at the college or no longer have uh, classes to take at this college 
at that particular time, because of that, uh, well, not for that money, yeah. um, the governor uh, uh, had little choice in the legislature but to cut our budgets, our community college budgets. And uh, without that stimulus, uh, we were facing program cuts, layoffs, and I'm very proud of the fact that we didn't have to have a single layoff at this college throughout all of that, and I don't think we ever will. But, uh, I mean, that is, it is um, uh, impossible to overemphasize uh, the importance of what he did uh, for us. I don't mean as a partisan comment, it's just, I know he gets blamed now for now he's re uh, that stimulus money put us further in debt. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, that's my take on it as a president of a, of a community college that would otherwise be uh, emasculated uh, were it not for that. Mm -hmm. The second point uh, is, uh, as you uh, quite uh, certainly put out, the cost, the obscene costs of education in this country, college, were it not for the community colleges. And, um, but what I see is a, uh, uh, Unfortunately, I don't share your hope uh, because, as much as I'd love to. What I see is a rising class, and I know you see it, the rising classism and racism uh, all, with regard to our field, education. Uh, I, I can't speak to others, but uh, other fields. But uh, the, those costs uh, now, and the, and the cry in this state and elsewhere to reduce uh, whatever community colleges are doing lends us to the question, who should go to college? Mm. And um, and your paper, your paper, uh, with the fellow travelers from Cambridge and everyone in there, they had an outrageous uh, editorial a couple of weeks ago about the people at Roxbury Community College should not pay attention to going to transfer uh, programs. They should concentrate on vocational programs. I mean, it's uh, you know Booker T all over again and out of the mm. out of the. I mean, that was outrageous. And if the Boston Globe can come to that kind of a conclusion, then I'm, you know, I really give up hope. I'm despairing about uh, uh, how we're doing. But I'm yeah. going too, too long. It's just the idea that community colleges are the hope. You're right. You go to UM uh, uh, Green Bay or wherever it is, and, and uh, UW, and uh, come to uh, community colleges, UMass Dartmouth. Um, we did a comparison. There's a private school nearby, Wheaton. If you go to BCC for two years, then go to Wheaton for two years, and graduate with a Wheaton Baccalaureate, you save seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. Half, you know, seventy-five thousand saved uh, by doing it this way. So I'm hoping that people will will see that. I'm going on too long, but I, <laughs> I'm very worried about the classism and racism that seems to be soaring as opposed to dwindling. Yeah, yeah. Um, carrying that a little more a little, in some more detail, when Obama. Uh, got the stimulus. Pa How many of you remember the stimulus package? Oh, good, 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 good. About eight hundred billion dollars. Okay, oh, no, eight hundred million. I'm sorry. I have to get my my billions and millions straight. Um, uh, that had to be eight. It was uh, the re he had the bitterly. You talked about gridlock. That was a bitter knockdown dragged out fight to get that stimulus package through. And many economists um, said it should have been double to truly jumpstart opportunity, jumpstart high-speed rail, jumpstart, um, keep lower even more the uh, I mean, add even more the federal commitment to college and public education that would have lowered the cost for you, 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 and you. Um, and okay, you know, you know, you, now you can get me pessimistic pretty fast because I mean, this is the hardest part, and this is the part that I think is the uh, uh, since we're, this is, uh, I, I was invited during Black History Month, I will say this is the, what I would say is the closet racism combined with classism. So I was in South Carolina uh, listening to Mitt Romney uh, speak um, at a couple places. And I ended up writing a column about the code language that still exists, particularly among Republicans, that appealed to the old um, racist wings of white voters. 
Um, Republicans have lately um, have, have ever more uh, leaning on the rhetoric of saying, we don't want any more entitlements. Uh, that's a fancy word for welfare. Um, and, and because of media stereotypes, my own profession has participated in this over many decades. The picture, the pain, the picture of entitlements, welfare, is disproportionately black. There's actually been media studies that shown that when a newspaper or magazine does features and stories uh, on welfare, they are more likely to feature people of color on welfare, um, even though two-thirds of people on welfare in America are white. And actually, the, uh, the recession has been fascinating because the fastest rise, and there was just, I, I commend to you a great, a, a typical New York Times reporting uh, about three days ago, a great piece on the fact that the fastest rise of the use of entitlements, <clears throat> food uh, we call them food stamps once upon a time, now they're called um, uh, SNAP, uh, the highest use of so-called entitlement, welfare entitlements during the recession has been among working class white people who have lost their jobs or have been or substantially uh, been cut back in their employment. Um, but the current candidate, crop of candidates of the Republican Party, uh, Newt Gingrich has told, said that black people need to be janitors, uh, black kids need to be trained to be janitors. The, that makes the Boston Globe look <laughs> lightweight. The, um, there's this whole patronizing rhetoric about all of a sudden black people need to settle for less. Um, and, uh, but I don't want to I want to be very careful and not limiting this to a, a black and white discussion because it's about everybody here. Because that entitlement mentality, that anti-entitlement mentality is exactly the same mentality why it is so hard to fund public education for everybody. Uh, we fund, I have, um, on a global scale, um, Again, and that, that gets back to that dichotomy of individuals and the group and what government is going to do for, for the group. Um, so the, the, even today, the federal commitment to public education amounts to less than, uh, correct me, Mr. President, if I'm wrong about this, even today, as much as you hear about uh, education on the campaign trail, uh, the federal commitment to public K through 12 is still less than 10% of school budgets around the nation. Less than 10%. I just told you about places like Sweden, Norway, uh, England. The federal commitment is like 50, 60, 80%. So that entitlement mentality I, the way it is, I, w I challenge everybody to th think of African Americans and the treat policy treatment as just merely the canary in the coal mine. That, um, that if you see, talk about entitlements as an attack on services for the poor, which have been depicted, as I mentioned, disproportionately with a face of color, I believe that that is only a Trojan horse for divestment from a whole host of other things. Give you one example. That affects everybody in this room. Even as we speak, the House, how many of you take public, transporta public transportation in some form, some way? Most of you drive cars here because of where the school is located? Okay. How many of you would actually want to take public transportation to school? Okay. Even as we speak, the, the, the House Ways and Means Committee, the Republicans run the House. They are trying to strip out of the um, current, the, the budget. Um, when you pay for gasoline, you pay an 18 cent, 18.4 cent a gallon tax on every gallon of gasoline. Sounds 
boring, right? Well, out of that 18.4 cents, two, uh, 2.86 cents <laughs> goes, is right now dedicated to public transportation. Right now, the Republicans are trying to strip that 2.86 cents out and dedicate it all to pet road projects. Now, 2.86 doesn't sense, doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it adds up to billions of dollars, billions that would go to better MBTA service. How many would rather like to see the those you've been to Boston like to see a better T service? How many of you would like to see bus service? There actually is no train that goes from Boston to Fall River, right? There's no bus that goes directly from Boston. To f Actually, I woke up this morning, totally naive. I woke up this morning at 5.30 to see if I could come here by public transportation. <laughs> and the soonest I could get here by bus is going to Providence first, and then it, I wouldn't get here until 10.30, which means I would have blown this talk. And that means getting on a bus at 8, the earliest bus is 8.30. So, so part of, I hope this is a long-winded way of saying that canary in the coal mine is a mentality that leads to a whole stripping of public services. And public doesn't know black, white, Asian, polka dot. It tends to more mean city services, isolated rural services that affect everybody. So, um, so um, the one of the key burning issues of the day, if you were to focus on any one thing, Occupy Streets, um, the, the, there's been a lot of articles about what the Occupy Wall Street movement should go, do next. Uh, I'm not going to run it or anything like that, but if I were to write about it, if I was to ask, you must write something about Occupy Wall Street and what they should do, it would be focused on getting the government to fund education seriously. In my view, compared to other nations, you want to know why we slip in behind on other issues such as math and sciences? My, my son, and I'll close on this piece. Uh, you, can, you can tell the president got me going. Um, my son, his youngest son, is finishing his junior year at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. How many of you ever heard of that? Yay! Um, and small liberal arts college in North Adams, the former North Adams State, and he's having a ball. And just like I told the early birds here that you can make anything you want out of college, he just came back from a semester abroad in Heidelberg, Germany, that he got through little old MCA. But with that gridlock that you're talking about, if that gridlock continues, those opportunities will be less and less for everybody. And it's been well proven that a huge key for success, for global success for us as students, is you getting out in the world. Any other questions? That, that address a bit what you were talking about, Mr. President? Yes. Uh, okay, Dan, you get a, a one as a. Uh, Okay. And I was hoping you could address the whole issue of criminal justice. Sure. And not only racial profiling and who's in prison and why, but also the three strikes in your out legislation that they're considering in, in uh, the legislature right now. Sure. Um, how many of you heard of the three strikes debate going on at the state level? Handful. How many even care about it? <laughs> about ten, good. Um, yeah, criminal justice is uh, fascinating because um, I actually asked Obama, um, how many of you know about the disparate sentencing in crack cocaine versus powdered cocaine? Hopefully you don't know this from a personal, at a personal level. <laughs> all right. So it's all tied together with three strikes. Okay, so l let me just give you like a, a two-minute primer from my point of view. America has the most per capita, we have the most prisoners in the world 
except for, I think, Russia. I think that numerically we actually have more prisoners than anybody except Russia. Um, and some people even call it the prison industrial complex. We've developed a series of laws over the last nearly uh, 35 years, since particularly beginning in 1986 with the cr um, Crime Act, of treating certain kinds of drugs, most notably crack cocaine, with much harsher penalties than for powder cocaine, even though there is no medical evidence that shows that someone who snorts gets it worse than someone who uh, sh uh, uh, shoots up, snor what, however you ingest your cocaine. I don't know. I personally don't know that. <laughs> so, um, but the penalties for crack cocaine are 100 times, were 100 times stronger than for powdered cocaine. So kids in the suburbs tend to be white. They do their powder. They get a tap on the shoulder if they get caught behind the white picket fence. And the young uh, black and Latino folks on street corners, which are who are easy for cops to pick up over the last 20, 30 years, they go to jail for, for a min mandatory minimums of 10, 15, and if it, depending on the, how much you had, got caught with, 20, 30 years. So the jails are hugely disproportionately filled, particularly the federal prisons. Are like, even though Americans consume illegal drugs at roughly their racial rates, which means uh, roughly 75% of illegal drugs are consumed by white people, and about 15, 20, 18% of Illegal drugs are consumed by black people, but we make up 13% of the population. You follow me that, right? That part. The, the people arrested for drug sentencing are like 80% black and brown, have been. So, I mean, I have written myself that this is no different than the old South Africa. Um, now, has there been progress since 1986? Yes, um, two major things. One is that finally after just in the last couple years, even Republicans, uh, most notably Lindsey Graham um, and uh, I believe Richard Lugar, um, the, the, disproportion, the disproportionate level even got to them to the point where Republican governors of, of certain states, Republican governors of Pennsylvania and other states, they said, we can't, our jails can't hold any more people. We've got to do something different. So in the in, in last couple years, um, the 100, what was called the 100 to 1, you know, for whatever one thing you had of crack, you needed 100 of powder to get the same sentence. That's now been reduced to 20 to 1. Medically, it's still not a justifiable ratio. It should be 1 to 1. But at least now it's 20 to 1. And there have been people now retroactively freed from prison because of those laws. The Supreme Court has also struck down as unconstitutional mandatory minimums. So now judges, they say, judges, you can, you can make your own judgments again. So they can take a look at individual cases and say that um, you don't really need that much time. <coughs> Massachusetts, unfortunately, is having what I would say is a fairly silly debate, uh, but it ha could have very serious consequences. Um, even at a time that crime nationally has gone down by most markers, um, some politicians to look tough on crime on Beacon Hill are trying to get reintrodu reintroduce a tough three strikes law that could possibly, the way it's written, um, put away nonviolent offenders for long periods of time. Um, luckily, uh, I think uh, there has been protests about it, uh, ranging from uh, black ministers to um, uh, Governor Patrick has ambivalence about it. Um, uh, they're trying to work on a compromise. Um, 
But California, three strike laws generally across the nation, most notoriously California and New York, those three strike laws, all they do, does everybody know what a three strike, I mean, do you know what three strike, it's probably, it's pretty logical. The third time you do a crime, it doesn't matter what the crime is. It could be a, it could even be not even a felony. If you have like prior felony charges, the third time you do anything, you're locked up well, for a long time, for a long time. So, um, and that rule, that by definition feels unfair to me. So, um, I don't, um, I, I think a compromise, the, the, the worst is, a, I mean, the best would be that the law just dies. Um, but hopefully, at worst case, there'll be a compromise that gives judges the, uh, the the, the uh, right to um, not throw away somebody, especially if, it's, if, it, if, the, if the offenses are relatively nonviolent. Yes? Uh, first of all, isn't the three strikes rules a type of law that they had in the pre revolutionary France? I don't know. They had the guillotine in France. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, uh, Yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know to what degree they had the similar thing in, in, in France. Anyway, um, I think that something that a lot of people don't get is that America's, like America's left is the rest of the world's center. And our center is the rest of the world's right. We're a very right wing nation. You know, I, I've heard that. And um, here's to a to certain degree. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting thought because it goes back to what I had mentioned before about the America not really engaging in the politics of the group. So a lot of my friends on the, who consider themselves on the left were all gaga about President Obama when he got elected. And I said, and they're all going on about, he's going to do this for health care, he's going to do this for the economy, he's going to do this for education. I says, I said, yeah, you better, you, you, you may want to do a little reality check on, on, on what you're thinking because I've, I've, I've met with the, the president-elect and he's a centrist. He's not liberal or definitely not left. He's pretty much down the middle. He's in, in, in some sense, he's not a whole lot different than Bill Clinton. D is that a bad thing or a good thing? It's not all bad. It's not all good. It's, 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 there's a, means he has a sensibility. He kind of, he knows, like Clinton, he knows what the right thing is on many issues. But, and I'll give you one, the crack powder cocaine sentencing. I actually did a column during the campaign that was critical, of, uh, uh, mildly critical of Obama because I asked him straight up, if you were president, would you get rid of this disparity, which is vastly disproportionately imprisoning young black men? And he said, well, you can look the column up. Uh, so I, he said, well, I don't know if we want to put all our eggs into that political basket which is a clear politician's message <laughs> that this is not the highest priority on my plate. And because to, let's face it, remember what I said about we're not even close to dealing with issues that disproportionately affect black unemployment, et cetera. If, you, if you're not going to do that, you're definitely not going to do anything about disproportionate effect on black prisoners. So um, he made the decision to um, um, park that. But luckily, the injustice of it was so powerful that even Republicans helped uh, modify that disparity. OK. I think time's up. Uh, let's give uh, Derek Jackson a big hand.